That particular conversation happened just today. And where are you taking me? Th that particular conversation happened just today. And where are you taking me? That particular conversation happened just today. And where are you taking me? Hey folks, I'm late and this is Natchian News. Word is my mother-in-law has cancer. Also, I may get kicked out of my house. I haven't slept well for the last week or so, and I think the color green has stopped existing, but all the other colors are untouched. I wonder what cyan looks like now. Life is hard, sure, but it's important to remember that it's not a series of goals, and therefore, failures. As Alan Watts puts it, it's more like a dance. I may have to shift tempo, that's all. Sorry, concentration is difficult. It was my birthday this Saturday, and I was able to get my brother-in-law, father-in-law, sister-in-law-in-law, mother-in-law, wife, and some woman named Bridget to stand in a lobby slash shop of a Cracker Barrel for 90 minutes to eat. And I'll be damned if it wasn't the most fun I'd had in days. On a separate note, the Knit Stories levels are over. I may insomnia something else, but I'm too tired to think about it right now. The guest voice for today is the If of Dreams, returning once again. I think he did a better David Mitch Marshall than I did. Let's listen, hmm? Whirlsend Gate, Episode 14, The Clearing, by Mike Rojas. Special guest voice, The If of Dreams, with Evil Seedlet. June, 1921, Blue Crow Avenue. David Mitch Marshall was scared to look away from the thing on the other side of the register. It was known as The Clerk. And every time David walked into the Bone and Bit grocery store, it spooked him. The clerk had no pigment or color in its skin. The clerk had no pupils. The clerk would not close its slacked jaw. David couldn't tell if the clerk had once been male, female, or human. So David Mitch Marshall stood in front of the clerk holding his loaf of bread and cheese, neither moving. In order to distract himself from the clerk, David turned to look over the store once more. It was a strange mixture of modern and ancient, with many items on display on the shelves around him. There was some vending machines that, for a penny, would dispense gum or Boston baked beans. On the other hand, there was also no electrics in the entire building, rather using black candles to light the place. The ones on the counter were in a dark blue candelabra and smelled like rust when they burned. There was also the leather-bound book on the podium near the bathroom that whispered secrets only the listener knew. But it wasn't the evil book, the black candles, or the gum that frightened David Mitch Marshall. It was the clerk. You have to buy something eventually said the smiling shadow that hung behind David Mitch Marshall at all times. The shadow's name was David Rich Marshall, and it usually got the non-shadow David into trouble, so David Mitch Marshall ignored him. Ahem. Melody Redmark stood behind David with a jug of sweet tea and tapped her toes. She was not fond of David Mitch Marshall, ever since he left her to die during their first adventure. Are you thinking? She asked. Or are you buying? I was just th thinking. David tried to say. Cheese and crackers, it's just the clerk. Give him your money and get going. David frowned at Melody, and, out of spite, did as she said. The clerk took David's money, like an automaton never looking or closing its disgusting mouth while working. It was the correct change, by the by. The clerk did not make mistakes. 
Above the store was a typical overcast day with signs of fog in the trees. When Melody left the bit and bone, David was outside wiping his hands on his jacket. Why must everything in this town be rotting? Blast it all. Oh, stop complaining, said Melody. What about the garden? Yes, the garden, echoed David Rich Marshall. David Mitch Marshall finished wiping his hands on a hanky and then tucked it into his pocket. What are you two on about? he said. Nothing grows in this horrible town. I've no idea how the farmers keep in the business. You're kidding, right? Melody said. I thought that's what you were getting food for. David shot Melody a look to show he clearly didn't know what she was talking about. The summer garden? Didn't anyone tell you? Since arriving in Worldsend, David Mitch and David Rich argued about the purpose of life. The world was always ending outside of town, what with the oncoming robot apocalypse, destruction of family values, a certain discovery of man's insignificance, and so on. David Mitch Marshall, the non-shadowy form, was convinced that, in ten years' time, all humanity would sink into a savage cannibalistic killing spree, murdering the children and the weak first, then turning on themselves until the last man would be overtaken by wolves. David Rich Marshall, the smiling shadow, agreed gleefully. They would sit in the office of Mr. Merrick, David's employer, and Rich would say, Oh, wouldn't it be fun to watch someone die today? Maybe one of the dirty Irish. Yes. What? Mitch would answer. That's horrible. No, no, no. It would not be fun. Oh, it's not so bad. It happens every day, I'm told. Why not give the victim's suffering some meaning by enjoying it? I can think of fewer things more vulgar, David Rich Marshall, than looking for s someone to die today. Mr. Merrick who would always be in the back room tinkering with beakers and notebooks, would lean through the doorway and ask, Is everything all right, David? Yes, Mr. Merrick. David would answer. Then David Rich would continue. Decay doesn't have to be horrible. Death might be quite pleasant for all we know. If all the righteous go to heaven, why wait? David Rich giggled. That's what we should do after work, David Mitch Marshall. Let's kill a priest today. I'd rather not, said David Mitch. Besides, I don't think there are any religious figures in the world, and... Th that particular conversation happened just today. David Mitch Marshall told Melody on the way down Redmark Street. And uh, where are you taking me? You lucky jerk, Melody said. My imaginary friend slit his wrists when I was ten. The two were riding in one of the horse-drawn carriages that started taxiing citizens in the last decade or so. Most people called them the horse and carrion, because the horse's rotting flesh dripped off their muscles. Despite that, and the smell, the ride was plenty smooth. He is not a friend. I keep telling people that, David said indignantly. Melody ignored him. When they crossed to the other side of the bridge over to Luca River, the girl pointed at a clearing on the island and said, We're going over there. The clearing was on a hill, in the middle of the island lined with bushes around the edge, as if to cage in the sunlight from above. That's when David noticed there was clean sunlight shining through a hole in the sky highlighting the clearing only. Surrounding it were houses in various states of disrepair, except for Jebediah's home, opposite Melody and David. His house was always well-maintained, if somewhat cluttered. Speaking of Jebediah, he was circling the clearing with Bloodhead in the new model of car. When David focused again on the clearing before him, he noticed under the sun were flowers many colored flowers and people picnicking on them. I 
don't understand. David stuttered. Neither do we. Melody shrugged. But every year, for as long as any of us can remember, this shows up on the summer solstice. She hopped off the carriage and into the circle of light. When it came time for David to step into the circle, he actually found himself hesitating. For so long he had been watching the world devour itself like a pit of hungry rats, and now this seemed like a trap. He imagined once inside the light he would catch fire, or everyone would turn into bleeding ghosts, or the flowers would spit poison darts at him. Is it really all right? He asked. Melody rolled her eyes at the man and charged onwards without him. Inside, she met Felix with a couple of Lillians waiting for her tea. David saw even John Davis sitting and reading at the corner of the garden. This image was so unlike everything David had seen in the last five months. You know it won't last, said David Rich Marshall, becoming blacker because of the sunlight. Eventually it'll fade, like everything, and... The shadow wasn't able to finish once David Mitch Marshall stepped into the garden. Can I join? He asked the group of people, pouring Melody's tea. Melody sighed and motioned David under their picnic blanket. Come on, then. And so, despite all odds against it, no one had spiders erupt from their eyes, nor did an angry beast come to rip their muscles from under their skin, nor did blood seep from under the grass. Nothing horrible happened to David Mitch Marshall, or the rest. For at least one day a year, the world wasn't ending. If you like Whirlsend Gate or Natchian News, hit like, share, subscribe, or whatever. There's also a link in the doodly-doo if you're kind enough to donate to the cause. Every dollar will be spent on sleeping pills and hard liquor. I'm not at liberty to explain why. Evil Seedlet has a YouTube channel. You should go look at her YouTube channel. Google Plus wants you to leave comments on her YouTube channel. Music for this show was unknowingly provided by Kevin McLeod at Incompetech.com. Links for everything can be found in the description. This episode's noun was candles. If you can navigate the tyrannical Google Plus system of replies, leave a comment suggesting your favorite person, place, or thing from this episode, and I will include it in the next episode, forming a chain of nouns. Or just send me a comment via Facebook or Twitface or natchevil at gmail.com. Whatever works. Have nothing but fun, YouTubes. Have nothing but fun. I'd rather not. Besides, I don't think there are any religious figures in the world and... What the hell?